Hey folks, David Stewart here. Hope you guys are having a fantastic day. Time for some literary analysis. We're going to be looking at The Skulls in the Stars by Robert E. Howard. It is the first story to feature Solomon Cain, and it was first published, I believe, in January of 1929 in Weird Tales. And interestingly, it has just entered the public domain, which means this story you can read for free. I will have a link down below in the description box to where you can find it on Project Gutenberg, and I've taken the liberty of recording an audiobook for you that you can listen to here on YouTube at your convenience before we jump into the analysis. It's a great story. It's a story that is strong enough even though it's fairly short to launch the career of Solomon Kane, who we'd see in lots of follow-up stories. Just as an aside, if you're looking for like a physical edition of these stories, I really like this one, The Savage Tales of Solomon Kane, illustrated by Gary Gianni. Lots of great illustrations and just really good typesetting. Great physical edition that you can get um, on Amazon for like $15. So, I want to talk about some key things with this story. First of all, the structure, which you should know. Um, it has the same sort of structure you'd have in a larger story, but it's condensed down and we kind of throw out a lot of the details that we'd have in, say, in a novel in order to achieve uh, a conflict and resolution in a manageable amount of space. The other thing that I really want to talk about is besides the, the characterization of Solomon Kane, which is important because this was the first story to feature him, is some of the ways that Robert E. Howard writes on the smallest level, the micro level, the sentence level, and even the word choice level that allow him to be such an effective writer in the short story format. I talked about it in another video. If you want to write short fiction, if that is something that appeals to you for practice or for any other reason, you need to be reading short fiction. And Robert E. Howard was a real master of both the short, short story, like 3,000 words, as well as kind of the novella or novelette going up to 20,000 words. Uh, so really, really good writer to uh, read, especially if you're looking to get into early genre uh, fiction, sword and sorcery or fantasy, um, covers all of those bases. So uh, The Skulls in the Stars uh, takes its name from a line that's you know uttered by a character. It just sounds cool. It has a good pulp name, but it doesn't really set up the conflict in a way that we would uh, really uh, understand. If we were going to name the the story after the conflict it would be like the moor road or something like that conflict is really basic we have two paths that solomon kane can take one is a less convenient path that goes through a swamp the other is kind of a highland path to go up to torker town we don't really know where that is it doesn't matter it's just where he needs to go to next and we set up the conflict by having solomon kane get stopped by a boy and the boy tells him not to take the swamp road that the moor or no to take the swamp road because the moor road is haunted and there's something that is killing people on the moor road now this is where we get the initial characterization of solomon kane because solomon kane does not want to to avoid the danger, but rather wants to seek it out. So we get an important piece of motivation for him uh, as a character that will work through all of his many adventures, which is that he wants to seek out and destroy evil. He is somebody who feels that his mission is to do good and to destroy uh, the works of evil. Um, so he decides to take the more road. So we have the setup of a conflict. Um, then we have the big danger, the big battle that happens kind of in the middle. And we're not really sure how things are going to turn out. We have uh, Solomon Kane attack a ghost and the ghost seems to be ethereal yet is able to do physical harm on him. Of course, this happens after um, Solomon Kane witnesses another person being killed by this ghost. So we have a real danger. We know that it's dangerous. We know that it can harm him, but he chooses to engage with it anyway. Again, that reinforces his sense of bravery and his desire to do good and to do God's will, even though uh, danger or death may befall him. And indeed, when he's fighting the ghost, first he fires a pistol. It's not effective. His sword isn't effective. Um, of course, we're going to see the pistol and sword in future adventures. And he begins to wrestle with him hand to hand. And eventually, we get this idea that even though he's uh, he's outmatched and he decides he probably will die, but he's not going to die running away from the ghost. He will die, uh, you know, facing the enemy and to have a good account of himself. 
Why would we have a good account of himself? Well, he's a Puritan. Well, he's a Christian, and that means you will have an accounting before God. So he really cares about what he does in this life because he is looking to the afterlife. And this is different from other, you know, uh, heroes that you might read, maybe even like Conan, who's not so concerned about the afterlife. You know, Conan really is uh, is a very down to earth character, whereas uh, Solomon Cain is thinking about higher level things, and that's really what motivates him. So that reinforces his character to a great uh, extent. Then we have a really great passage where um, Howard leaves off what Solomon Cain figures out about the ghost. He ends that section with this idea that the ghost maybe has revealed something, uh, but we're not entirely sure what he has revealed. And I'll go ahead and read that passage, which, of course, you can see in the, uh, in the audiobook. Uh, he did not hear and comprehend as a man hears. Oh, wait, uh, I'll go one, one further. His flesh crawled and his hair stood on end, for he began to understand its gibbering, this ghost's gibbering. He did not hear and comprehend as a man hears and comprehends the speech of a man. But the frightful secrets it imparted in whisperings and yammerings and screaming silences sank fingers of ice and flame into his soul, and he knew. Right? So... What did he know? Well, we're going to find out in the next scene. This is a really good device that you can use is to break the scene and don't tell the audience what they want to know. If you want to know how George R. R. Martin writes page-turning novels, he does this in every single chapter over and over again. He doesn't tell the audience what the resolution of. He doesn't give you the resolution for the scene. He doesn't tell you what you need to know uh, to uncover the mystery of what this thing is in the morgue. So the next scene Solomon Cain is quite alive. This whole next part is really to, uh, and it's listed as, as part two here, um, it really exists to resolve the conflict that we established in the first half of the story. And we're going to resolve it in a really interesting way. This, in a normal construction, would be a very long resolution. Usually you'd want to keep keep the resolution to like 10% of the total length of the of the story. So if you have a 3,000 word story, you'd want the resolution to be, you know, 300 to 500 words, right? So one page, um, not very much. In this case, it's a whole second half, but there's uh, so much that gets revealed and there's so much characterization that happens for Solomon Kane's character. It really is still very effective. So part of what I say in the, you know, keys to prolific creativity, you can't be afraid to break the rules. Um, what he does is he brings the villagers to this uh, house in the swamp. Now, the boy had mentioned the guy in the swamp. So um, Howard's very careful to introduce this character before this. Hey, there's this guy out in the swamp. He'll actually probably let you stay the night, just go the swamp way. Um, so we already have the details we need in order to understand how Solomon Cain solves the mystery. He gets some information from the ghost. The information from, that he gets from the ghost is that the ghost was the brother of this guy that uh, lives out in the swamp. And uh, Solomon Cain basically uh, figures out that the ghost was like tortured by, um, and maybe even murdered by this uh, guy who lives out in the swamp. And instead of, uh, you know, doing a regular execution, he drags the guy to this oak where the ghost inhabits. And we he tells a youth to go up the tree and he pulls out a skeleton. And that skeleton, of course, is the hidden body of the man's brother. And so we have all of the elements of the mystery kind of laid out for us really quickly uh, and how Solomon Cain figured them out, figured them out by directly attacking the ghost. So it's still kind of a mystery, mystery format for the plot, but it has this great resolution. And rather than like hanging the guy for murder, he uh, ties him to the tree and is going to let the ghost kill him because that is what's going to solve the bigger conflict of the ghost that is inhabiting this Moor Road. The ghost will be satisfied by killing his brother and the ghost will then depart and leave. And there's some other really important characterization uh, elements that happen here. So at one point here, Solomon Cain basically says, loosen his bonds a little bit because a man ought not die you know, chained up, but should be able to, to face his doom on his feet. Um, you know, let him make his peace with Satan, whom he is more likely to meet, said the Puritan grimly. The sun is about to set. Loose his cord so that he may work loose by the dark. 
since it is better to meet death free and unshackled than bound like a sacrifice. So this is another element of Solomon Cain is that he has a lot of honor. So rather than merely executing him, rather than tying him up to be tortured, he leaves some sort of out for him. He leaves a way for, for, for him to escape, for him to be able to have some sort of redemption at, at the end of it. Uh, he wants sinners essentially to be redeemed. He doesn't want them to just die forever, but he feels a weight in sentencing this man to death. And then he says, um, you know, um, life was too good to him, though he was gnarled and churlish and evil, Cain sighed. Mayhap God has a place for such souls, where fire and sacrifice may cleanse them of their dross as fire cleansed the forest of fungus things. Yet my heart is heavy within me. Nay, sir, one of the villagers spoke, you have done naught but the will of God, and good alone shall come of this night's deed. Nay, answered Cain heavily, I know not. I know not. So he has a certain, he has an uncertainty about his actions, right? Are they sinful? Are they good? He's doing the best to do good, but he, he always, he still has a depth to what he's thinking about. He's a brooding hero. He's not merely a hero that is, um, just acting all the time and is impulsive, but someone who really thinks about what he's doing. And I think there are parallels to some of the other characters that Robert E. Howard has written, uh, particularly Cole, Exile of Atlantis, but also Conan. Conan is a bit more brooding, I think, than he gets credit for. He's a far more intelligent character than how he's often portrayed after Howard's death. Um, but Cole, in particular, is, a, is has a lot of the sensibilities of uh, Solomon Cain. He thinks about what he's doing. He considers the, philo the philosophical impact. Am I doing the right thing with all of these sorts of things? Am I doing the right thing? And the final scene is a is kind of a horror scene where we see the ghost overtaking the miser from the swamp and thus resolving the conflict. We don't really need a lot more than that to say, oh, well, now the Moor Road was cleared. We know what happened. What happened was what Solomon Cain set up to happen. Um, in the story. So that's the structure and how that structure supports the characterization of Solomon Cain. And I think because of the, the way that he reacts to everything, both in attacking evil and in considering the, uh, the depth of, uh, of having to damn a man, having to give a man unto death, uh, weighs heavily on him. He doesn't just do things lightly. Rather, he's concerned for his soul. He's deeply concerned about giving a good account to God. And I think that really uh, makes an impact on the character, makes us want to know more about him. Who is he? Where is he traveling to? What is he going on about doing? And uh, maybe some of his history. He mentions the Spanish Inquisition and witch, witch hunts and things like that. So maybe we want to know more about who this guy is. That makes for a great setup for uh, continued adventures with Solomon Cain. So it's a really, really good way to introduce the character. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the micro level of what's going on, because I think that's very important as well. The way that uh, Robert E. Howard is able to frame a story and create conflict and resolution and intense characterization in a short amount of uh, time is not just his mastery of the structure, but his mastery of the micro level, being able to write good sentences and especially choosing very good words to communicate his ideas. So you'll notice when you read it, he uses a lot of color words. Uh, color words are words that have a strong impact on the reader and have a lot of meaning attached to them. So it's like the difference between calling something red and calling something crimson. Crimson has a weightier, darker, uh, more specific uh, meaning to it when we hear it. It, it has a bigger impact. It's a color word. And I'm literally talking about a color, but uh, red, you say, oh, the, you know, the his blood, there was a red stain upon the ground. Or it's like versus crimson spilled upon the ground. Like, you know, you get ooh, crimson. So he uses a lot of these words to describe Cain, to describe uh, just everything that's, that's going on. So when you get the initial description of Cain, uh, he was tall, gaunt man with Solomon Cain. Gaunt. Ooh, gaunt has like a really good meaning. We, now we could say he had thin cheeks or blah, blah, blah. We could start describing his physical appearance um, in great detail, but uh, that's going to waste a lot of space for a pulp magazine. So we'll say gaunt, and gaunt has a lot of meaning to it. Uh, his darkly pallid face. Well, pallid and darkly seems to have two different meanings, but when we combine them, they're not as, uh, they're not as opposite as we think. 
we hear darkly pallid and we start to think a man who's maybe uh got a dark countenance like a frown but he's got pale skin you know he's got uh you know a worn look to him darkly pallid and deep brooding eyes deep and brooding eyes made more somber by the drab puritanical garb he affected what a great way to introduce a character we get so much of the sense of him we're not you know we could describe him very plainly that he was uh he was tall and thin with hollow cheekbones he had pale skin and um you know he had uh, blue eyes and he stared a lot and um you know he wore a dark puritan outfit doesn't quite the same dark brooding eyes that he's contemplative we get a depth of the character by describing his physicality using these really um, strong color words what i call them color words now you don't want to necessarily overuse color words like if you just start linking up a bunch of words with highly specific meanings it can be almost overwhelming but in this case it's really just one sentence and it has a lot of weight to it and it works um, far back in kane's gloomy eyes a scintillant light had begun to glimmer. Ooh, great word choice there to me. You couldn't just say like, you know, he looked surprised. We're telling the audience instead of showing them. Like this is more like showing versus telling, even though we're always technically telling. Um, uh, had begun to glimmer like a witch's torch glinting under fathoms of cold gray ice. So we have an image. We have a simile that draws an image a witch's torch what is a witch's torch we don't know but witch has a lot of words attached to torch like something magical glinting under fathoms of cold gray ice we would almost never say fathoms but we can imagine maybe a glacier and it's translucent and so there's some kind of light in his eyes adventure the lure of risk life risk and battle the thrill of breathtaking touch and go drama not that Cain recognized his sensations as such. He sincerely considered that he voiced his real feelings when he said, These things be deeds of some power and evil. The lords of darkness have laid a curse upon the country. A strong man is needed to combat Satan and his might. Therefore I go, who have defied him many a time. Right? Um, so we, in a short amount of space, we have Cain tell you about himself as well as get a descriptor heavy descriptors not just of how he looks but how that look should make us feel about the character um, all of these things really help to sell the story and sell the character uh, one of the things you'll find when you read a lot of Robert e. Robert e. Howard is he's able to use these words over and over again in lots of different um, characters he's not really afraid to use kind of use them repeatedly in a story as long as they have weight and meaning you got to remember that this is written for a pulp audience they weren't analyzing every word they wanted a story that would affect them quickly and entertain them before they moved on to another story so the other thing he does and you'll find this in some conan stories is he starts with a poem and the poem says uh he told how murderers walk the earth beneath the curse of cain with crimson clouds before their eyes and flames above about their brain for blood has left upon their souls its everlasting stain. Hood. You know, into this world, Conan, destined to wear the crown of all Aquilonia, right? So this really frames the idea of what we're supposed to feel about this story. To me, it just reminds me of like Halloween. That's the best way I could put it. It's, it's like a great Halloween story uh, because of all of the framing and the imagery and the ghost and the attack and the old oak. It just It's full of such American Halloween imagery. It's, it's hard to... It's hard to place this in any season besides autumn, but he never describes this season. I always think it's autumn simply because of the way he describes the, the rippling grass and the dark swamp and the, the fog and those sorts of things. That just makes me think of autumn, um, which is very interesting that he's able to give you descriptions of places and give you a feel that goes with them. Uh, so yes, take a listen to it or look at it. Let me know what you think down below in the comments. This is your uh, now 20 minute analysis of solomon cain the skulls and the stars that's what the that's what the the miser yells into the into the sky and that's where you get the name sounds cool it's a cool sounding name uh anyway let me know what you think down below and i'll talk to you all next time have a great great day